when I was 15 or 16 years of age, I'd start thinking about the meaning of life. I'm born in a small village, and suddenly I realized there has to be something more to do if you want to understand this thing that nobody really seems to understand, life. So therefore, I decided if I cycle from the southernmost tip of South America to the northernmost tip of <laughs> North America, surely I must understand the meaning of life. So that's what I did. Took two and a half years. And when I got to Alaska, I realized I don't really understand anything, so I guess I have to continue. So then I cycled from the north <coughs> post, uh, northernmost point of Europe to the southernmost tip of South Africa. Took almost three years. And when I got to the end of Africa, I realized I don't really understand anything, do I? So I guess I have to continue. So then I decided to cycle from New Zealand through Asia to Cairo and Egypt. Took two and a half years. So after cycling for nine years, not really understanding anything, I, I, I figured maybe I'm traveling too fast. So then I decided to go to Patagonia. So I spent a year in Patagonia, and very little people here. So I spent a lot of time wiping out every little corner in my both parts of my brain. And I realized if I have to understand anything, I have to try to understand myself. So I decided to live with the Maasai in East Africa for a year, because untouched by modern civilization as they were, I thought this is the way to understand myself and life. And during this year, I suddenly realized the only way to understand anything, I have to live in an environment quite similar to my own. And I come from the northernmost part of the great state of Dorana here in Sweden. And I realized the only place I can go to is most likely Siberia. Siberia changed my life. It ruined my life, but it made it much better as well. And I learned some really important lessons here. Most important was because I've been thinking about mankind a lot. And I choose a part of Siberia where the dictator Stalin placed his worst reputed concentration camp, the gulags, where more than three and a half million people went through and hundreds of thousands of people died. And I thought that will give me a perspective to understand the meaning of life. And I knew, of course, that this was the coldest inhabited place of Earth. However, during 25 years of traveling, I've always chosen to go to extreme parts of the world because a long time ago I realized you have to come across people who, are, who, who spend a lot of time thinking where very few other people are. They understand it. So I went here, and I also realized that to really understand the meaning of life, you almost have to lose your life before understanding it. And during these 25 years, when I spent one year in Siberia, it felt like I was losing it every day there, because it's extremely, extremely cold. Together with Johan Iverson, I traveled for one year in temperatures almost below 60 degrees Celsius. And it's almost impossible to explain for somebody like yourself who's got no idea how cold it is when it's below 60. <laughs> what I can tell you is that most of the time you're really, really scared. You're afraid of losing your life. And after four days of traveling, because we were pulling 330 kilos of weight, I suddenly realized that it was something wrong with my elbows and my knees. Because every time we stopped, I had a lot of pain. And suddenly I realized what was happening was that the liquid in the knees and the elbows was freezing to ice. So the only way to continue, of course, would be to continuously move never stop, because every time we stopped, it was like we turned into frozen timber and wanted to fall over. <laughs> Nobody had told us that, well, we knew that all metals, everything would break eventually, but we didn't know it would break after only two days. And worst of all, of course, because we spent 15, 16 hours every day pulling this enormous load. Every time we stopped, we had this pain, so we had to continue. 
worst of all was when it was time to go inside and rest, of course. Petrol froze, so we couldn't eat anything. The only thing we could eat was frozen fish traganina that we brought with us. So we kind of took it, if you imagine, you go to the supermarket here and buy a f raw frozen fish and then you stick it on the mouth. And initially, before we learned, it froze to our lips, of course, so we looked like hammer sharks when we were walking <laughs> around there. But the only thing we could eat was frozen fish. When it was time to go to bed, of course, we, was, we were so tired after pulling for 16 hours and we were freezing that much. So every time we lay down on our backs, we shot up like an arch like this, just shivering, shivering. I'm sure most of you have felt really cold once or twice in your life when you shiver and you can't control it. Maybe you felt it for 30, 40 seconds altogether. We spent days, hours just shivering like this. The only thing which kept us alive then was that we knew Everything, bacteria, we can't get pneumonia, we can't get anything because it's all frozen. So the only way for us to die is to freeze to death. And that was very helpful to know. What, the, you'll never see a colder picture like this. Every single centimeter of the body is more or less covered by ice like an armor. And the pain that you feel is incredible. It, it is such a pain, so you really want to scream, but of course you don't have the air. If you open your mouth, it gets covered by ice all the time. And the only reason that we actually did survive was the Siberian way to look up on life. Because we came here to meet other people, that was the main idea, to come across all these people. And I learned four important lessons there which completely changed the way I look at life. Can you imagine after traveling for 30 days, you come into a small little village and you meet Sasha here and his son Sasha. They're all called Sasha or Siriosha along Kolima here. And when we came into the village, we were scared because we realized we do one little mistake and we are dead. And traveling with worry is dangerous and it's difficult, takes a lot of energy. Sasha changed it immediately because as quick as we met him, he came up to us, showed us a big skin after a wolverine he had killed. Same wolverine he has on his head here. And he was talking, you know, into detail how he had killed it. He was so happy because it's such a nice fur. And his son came up, Sasha, with a really big nose like this. And I saw at the tip of his nose was really black, like a black ball. And during the time we were talking to him, suddenly, the tip of the nose dropped off. <laughs> I've never seen people losing their tip of their nose. <laughs> Noses, so I was shocked. So I looked down on the tip of his nose, lying in the snow, and he suddenly realized I wasn't listening to his fantastic story about the Wolverine. So he looked at me and he said, why are you not listening, he said, and I pointed to the nose. And then he got upset and he said, normal, now this is Siberia, he said, and then he continued to tell his story. And then I realized, that's how life is. You have to take it as it is. Stop worrying. So we stopped worrying there, and things became better. Because everything you see here is difficult to understand. It's 60 below zero here. He's working four or five hours every day in water like this. Any one of you would do it without gloves. We would have to amputate within four hours. And it all has to do, because I've had very little problem during these 24 years with people. And it all has to do with kind of an attitude you have. Humor is very important, but as important is to have the right attitude when things happen. I was we were staying in this house you saw here for almost six weeks. After two days, we, we had problems sleeping because there were cockroaches as big as you all, at least as this. And they were crawling back and forth of our bodies all night. And I went down to the, into the neighbor, complained and said, I'm fed up with these cockroaches, I said. And then he told me, do you know what is your problem, brother? You got the wrong attitude. <laughs> if you instead look at these cockroaches as the best friends you have in life, now then what is the problem, he said. So I changed attitude and I had a lot of friends after that. <laughs> So that is very important attitude. 
Another thing you learn which shapes your life a lot is that you have to understand that never judge any other people. That's something we do a lot. Meet Pavel here. When I came across him, he had nowhere to live, nowhere to stay. He just walked around Siberia hoping somebody would take him in. He had killed 50, 100 people, executed them. Because what happened during the Soviet era was that they took local native people like him, who was a then as hostage, and his family. And if somebody ran away from the gulags, they just sent one of them after a good hunter like Pavel, catch them, execute them with a bullet in the neck, hack off the arm, take it back to the commander of the camp, throw it on the floor, and they kept the family as hostage until they said, this is OK, you can be free. But he never got his family back. And he's probably killed 50, 100 people. He's still one of the best human beings I've ever come across. And when I asked him, what do you feel when you've done all this? And he said, it's normal now. This is Siberia. Everyone is like, you don't know what people have done out there. You just have to survive. And I realized he was right. Most important was, though, that I realized the only way to survive and enjoy life, you have to communicate. You have to be together with other people all the time. Just to give you an idea, I spent about eight to 10 hours almost every day the last month traveling over the tundra, which is in reindeer cots like this. And we were talking, gossiping about nothing and everything all the time. And these people, they have a heart so big because life is so hard here. So I realized the only way to feel any contentness of life is to help others. For an example, in the beginning when we came out on the tundra, I asked, how many skins of reindeer do you need to buy to, to build a cot like this? And a woman inside, she said, maybe 85, 86. And every time I came to a new cot, I said, you need 85, 86 cots, don't you, to live in a place like this? And most of the time, they said, yeah, well, more or less. But always after having been here, something happened. For example, five days after I met this woman, a snowmobile turned up and with this guy here, and he had traveled 18 hours in minus 50 below zero. When I met him, his, his, the side of his face and his ear was completely blue and black because they were frozen, but he hadn't stopped. And the only reason he's traveled all this time without stopping was that he wanted to come and tell me that one really needed 96 skins to build a good raincoat, <laughs> dear God. And I was shocked to so ask him, why do you travel like this to tell me this? And I, he answered, Normal now, this is Siberia, he said. <laughs> and that's the end of my story. Siberia saved my life, but ruined it as well. These people who live out here, they know pretty much everything. And they are the best people I've ever met. And I hope you one day will meet them. Thank you very much. That was the lesson of Normalna, the Siberian way. <laughs>